Well, let's go. Let's go with Angora Poets World Cafe on this Sunday, April 24th, 2022, don't you know? Uh, coming in from San Francisco and Paris and New York and, uh, well, all points by the end of the evening. So I'm Mo Singer. I'm one of your poets. And we want to welcome you all who are listening. And uh, I want to remind you at the beginning of this that I started a Angora Poets group. And I think all of you are in it. That way I can talk to you directly with invitations and any corrections without you going, what does what this invitation mean? What does that mean? Oh, Angora Poets. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm inviting people to join that. So it makes my life easier sending one direct mailing and it tells you, oh, this must be about Angora. I'll open it. And uh, it's nice that fellow poets are talking to one another on that, on that page. So to get on with it, uh, I want to introduce somebody from right here in, uh, well, no, no, I'm not going to go right here. I'm going to go to Harlem. I'm going to go to over there right now. Let's go to Harlem, USA, and uh, introduce our man who didn't come here to tap dance, okay? I think he wants to hit it on the one tonight, and that's Angoma Hill. Hello, Angoma. Hey. You're on, babe. Uh, okay. All right. Good, good, good. Let's, let's, let's rock. This, this is um this piece is called Jesus Whip. The epigraph is soon I will be done with the troubles of the world, the troubles of the world, the troubles of the world. These tea baggers, so-called believers in the Christ myth, piously sing, oh how they love Jesus. Would they invite him to the table because he was homeless? Deny him a job seeing brown was the color of the skin he was in, had long hair and chased money changes out of temples, deemed an outlaw, profiled as Palestinian because he came from Galilee and lived amongst the poor. Would they break bread and wash his feet, find him a clean robe, some food to eat, or leave him in the street? Would he be tear gassed and locked up because he protested against war? Would they be angry that they had free will and a right to choose and that they have no one but themselves to blame if they win or lose? Would they understand he'd take a stand with the oppressed against the strong? Could they live doing what's just and good, choosing right from wrong, not expecting heavenly rewards? Could they believe and practice the idea that all creatures should be free? Would they believe when I tell them Easter is a pagan holiday. Would they believe when I tell them anyway? Tell me, what would it take before they can see he wasn't sent here to be hanging from a tree? He wasn't sent here to be hanging from a tree. That's one. Ah. That was good. Thank you. Thank you. I, this one is from the book. I didn't come here to tap dance. It's called They Walk Through Life with Eyes Wide Shut. In denial that their TV sets lie, that their holy books are plagiarized by amnesia patients suffering post-traumatic stress since the Spanish Inquisition, trading land for beads and Bibles to those who could not read, then forced them to believe that the cross would save them. They said, believe us, but it didn't save Jesus. Immaculate conception, reincarnation, resurrection, or suffer the wrath of the sword in those days of dark called medieval, ruled by society's secrets, degrees and planets, evicted from temples, numbers keepers. King James, the filthy drunken pervert, seed the scrolls and flipped the scripture, but never got instructions to decipher the inscriptions passed down by master teachers, otherwise known as Egyptians. So tell me, who's defining this definition? Did he fit the description, the lineup of those accused of treason? Tell me, Buddha, what do you think of this new guy, Jesus? Should we ask Krishna if he's come to confuse us? After all, crusaders burn witches at the stake. So was he sent to deceive us with the veil of misconception that there was only one immaculate conception, crucifixion, resurrection? 
But first, you'd better take a look at the planet's ancient mystery books. It doesn't take a CSI to know there were thieves in the temple. Word, that lying Judas. You mean he didn't speak of Horus or Attis, Krishna or Dionysus, Buddha or Mithra, and those of every family? You'd best to find the righteous path, learn the science and the math to play the dozen. To everything there is a season, 12 tribes equal 12 disciples equal 12 constellations or planets around Horus, the sun, the secret of life is one. How do I know this, you ask? At high noon, I shapeshifted into a dove. I was there when he stood in a circle squared. Okay. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed also my... Uh, Hearing you talk about the association to 12. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Was it 12? Would you repeat that 12 cycle you, um, you have? 12 tribes equal 12 disciples equal 12 constellations of planets around Horus, the sun. Okay. I'm always fascinated when numbers come up. Uh, but, that's a whole story about thinking them somehow numbers are beneath all communications or all understanding. Well, I don't know if they're always right, but I'm fascinated when I hear numbers, you know. Okay. So three's a charm, Angoma. We're ready for three's a charm. Okay. I hadn't planned on reading this one, but I think I'll just continue in the same kind of vein from I didn't come here to tap dance. This, this poem doesn't really have a title. It's called Countdown to 65. When I was about to be 65, that, that during that time I was writing poems, Counting Down to 65. This was poem 13. I've been digging through the contradictions, trying to find my way back to beginnings, walking in circle spiral, searching for the light. I've been turning over rocks, studying how his story turns back clocks, redefining definitions, separating spirit from apparition, searching catacombs and caves, found out secrets that were amazing, amazing, deciphered my way through mazes, trying to find the way, studied Bibles, Metunita, the Tao, the Quran, and texts from mystery schools, philosophers, scholars, and fools, searched books to find Jesus, found that he was no Christian, now question his existence, and understand your resistance to believe these things I'm finding. But I question that book you call the Bible, wondering why, who we should hold liable for the survival of these lies, distorted scriptures in disguise. Heteru was the sun god, misinterpreted as God's son. Make sure to look closely, you can see or saw or set in Heru, the Holy Trinity, as written in the book of coming forth by day. Greeks call it Biblios Helios. Its real name is the sun book. These doctrines need investigation since the Nicene Convention, when rulers change the holy text, so you won't know what's coming next. Full deception to control by fear, got you believing in revelations, ignoring reincarnation, thinking that the end is near. So be conscious of what you read. These rulers lie and deceive. Then perhaps you'll make the decision to return to your ancestors' vision. Okay, all right. Okay, the Nicene Convention, that's what did it, man. Right. An in-group led by that archbishop said, we're going to kick out a whole lot of literature, especially that talked about egalitarian practices of Christians and the rule of Mary Madeline, and that's not going to go into the Bible, you see. Okay. And so we're, we're, we're going to be good traditional Semites, Christians, but Semites, which is what? Hard on women and hard on others. They have that in common, no matter how many disputes they have between themselves. That was very interesting with that, that council did, man. Jesus gets the blame, you know, I, Jesus gets the blame on all that. And like, for instance, I didn't hear Jesus say, build a wall around them Palestinians. <laughs> We'll nah. win by killing them, killing the opposition. Anyway, thank you, Angola. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, so now we're gonna <clears throat> now we're gonna move on to are you, to Laura Gravel, who uh, I forgot to ask you, where in the world are you tonight in your world? Today I'm in Shepshed, England. Okay, you're in. Okay, <laughs> so we know you get around a lot. And uh, hi, Benedicta. We see your we see your messages, your little chat. 
Good to see you. Okay, so Laura, we're ready to hear from you. Well, wow. Well, there's a caption right there. Whoa. Okay. So, uh, Laura, we are ready uh, to hear your three. Okay. Well, after Ngoma, I have to pick a certain one. Otherwise, I look like a wimp. So I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> Sometimes we're a hard act to follow, whoever follows somebody. <laughs> That's... It's a hard act to follow in Goma. That's okay. what's good about Angora poets. <laughs> Ain't no lightweights. So this one, just a second. On. This one is, uh, uh, so it refers to Geneva, which is Geneva, Switzerland. And I lived there for a couple of years at one point. So this is, in the past, Angora poets, some of them I've done, some of my one woman show, about living in different places and uh, you know started US Mexico and then uh, Austria was turning 40 at a Tupperware party and I did little ones and then yeah I remember the Tupperware yeah Italy I haven't done yet because I need to practice because I have to sing a lot of it <laughs> so, so what do you have for us tonight Laura I'm, I'm skipping to Geneva all right let's okay. go it's called Geneva you old woman <laughs> Geneva, you old woman covered in sores who loaned me a terrible old pot for making spaghetti. You teenager named Cedric careening down the route de Malanou on your rollerblades to school. You bearded Swiss German with a creek running through your living room filled with money. You young American man with your head held high speaking no word to nobody. You Lebanese daughter of a Beirut book publisher who made me an herbal tea for my tummy troubles. You Bolivian mother taking care of a Spaniard's children to send money to yours. You French doctor named Bruce married to a French woman named Peggy. You who are the daughter of a running mafia man and who teaches at the school for the psychotic dangerous ones. You worried man in a wheelchair, born and bred on the Malanou, renting out your rooms, living hand to mouth. You Sri Lankan upper class refugee working at the UN and married to an Italian architect. You tall, sinuous Russian redhead cavorting in silks on the top floor. You Brazilian nanny for the babies of African diplomats. You, Finnish activists, speaking English to your Flemish husband while your children school in French. You, sad, penniless orchestra director, refugee from Bosnia, working construction six days a week. You, chic in long tunic, leading your entourage from your private jumbo jet to the Lac Le Mans summer fair. You toddler of Argentine and Venezuelan Harvard graduates. You nervous trumpet, trumpet playing Serb son of parent psychiatrists. You woman born here but adopted and actually a cross between a Tennessee country Western singer and a traveling Canadian girl. You five-year-old child of grateful to be from China couple. You rabbi with your great festive wagon wheel hat and full robes headed into the Hebrew college. You old man from Venice who courted me, a married woman, and held my hand in the Parc de Malanou. And you, my kind Swiss Jewish friend who'd lived in America and Israel, who liked to speak English to me while our children played together. Tell all the others to shout out now. Geneva, you city of foragers, tell me your truths. Oh, wow. Applause, Mita, on that too. Jeez. Well, you, you, wow. Boy, you were, you were cutting deep there, Laura. Wow, that'll stand some people up, man. That'll raise some eyebrows. <laughs> A friend from Geneva said, oh, can I read the one about Geneva? And I said, no. <laughs> yeah, just park your car. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, she's very sweet, you know. It's, you know, I mean, that, 
that's not about people being bad. It's it's about this amazing uh, mix of people. But yeah, Geneva is a hard place. Hard okay. Place. All right. Well, let's have uh, your next poem there, Laura. Okay, I'm going to have to figure. Let's see. Um, oh, yeah. I'm just going to go to this one now. So, All right. Again, I've got Ngoma in front of me. <laughs> okay, this is called The Plain Lands. The smell of dust, the yellow haze, the instant sweat, the flitter and flutter of palm trees, the patter of heart in dread. Houston, and soon the dinosaurs will show, and they are dead. Those who come mooing, asking for recompense. We give them bananas and locks of our hair, offer purses from Walmart to those who come weeping, asking for band-aids for the bullet wounds. We offer them two for one tacos by Bill, a haircut and toenails at Tammy's, and recommend the salsa at noon to those who wear twigs to disguise their skulls while we eat wool to pronounce the words that they are dead. I find their tracks in the mud, Tyrannosaurus teeth embedded in my head. Follow, follow, the bayou calls. Laissez le bon temps rouler. At one, a meeting at the swamp of oil. The rig wades in, the hurricane approaches. Gale force winds are sent to mend rescind words not well meant play dear triceratops jump rope dare find me fresh hope tell the boy who once loved me that i'll be found on the city street tell the boy who kept his hands hid deep to pick my bones by the stego humps and they are dead those graffitied snouts and tails, still called a cow town by local Long Islanders, too young to recognize primordial. This city left Jim Crow mood on to integration, where the Vietnamese have settled Viet Town, a city of restaurant sinks on skyscrapers, on telephone poles, on alligators that simmer Nguyen's Vietnam War Memorial with crawfish and noodles and faux ben served hot on radio saigon houston <laughs> have you seen the harbor open his mouth to yawn he has swishman la salle the name of your grandmother nasa and the moon the dino tracks keep on a coming hey big fella take a swig <laughs> of bayou water Take a swig of Texas crude. Laissez le bon temps roll. Okay. <laughs> wow. That's going to win you a lot of popularity in Texas now after, after, <laughs> after Gen Geneva. Go ahead. I see why you're up there in England at this point. You gotta make sure. Keep your safety. Okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Texas. Yeah, what I liked about Texas, I love about Texas. And what I don't like about Texas, I stay the hell away from if I'm smart. I'll tell you right now, they they, they didn't want to debate a whole lot, if you know what I mean. Okay, so freeze the charm, Laura. Let's well, hear freeze the charm. Okay, those were long, but I can do another one if you want me to. Please, three, we do three per round. Okay, then I'm only doing a short one because the other one I have up is very long. I see. Okay. This is called, and it's totally different from the others. <laughs> this is called Tennis Shorts on Aisle 9. She pushed the cart through the aisles, filled it with good-smelling fruit and sighs, pushed it through the display of potatoes and the neighbor's peccadilloes, didn't see the tunnel that led through tomato vines and her avocado betrayal. Pushed it past back doors and dirt clods and worms and women's artichokes. Couldn't feel the damp nor the rot of years, but smelled the sweaty hair of those rotting cantaloupe. 
people should watch how they display their wares. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. They should watch. Don't trust your average cantaloupe. <laughs> All right. Well, you're up and at him, Laura. I don't think you had it. You've proven there was no need for your reluctance to follow Ngomo because between the two of you, well, yeah, we're cooking with gas tonight. All right. So thank you, Laura. Okay. I said thank you, Laura. Already unmuted. Muted. Uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's see where we're going to go next. Well, okay. Now we're going to leave. We're going to leave those uh, particular locations and uh, history comments, and, and go over to uh, San Francisco with our ethereal writer uh, Dharma Dave. Give us something from the ether or whatever you wish, Dharma. Uh, okay, and thanks. And I just wanted to let you guys all know I just got an email yesterday that uh, I'm going to be uh, included in the Revolutionary Poets Brigade's summer 2022 issue, Real Printed Word, and invited to, uh, to uh, perform at the, uh, the book launch reading in July in San Francisco. So I'm very pleased. Oh, great, about that. great. Yeah. All right. You're hitting it, Dharma. Well, well you know, it's about uh, the poetry. It's interesting how, you know, my Paris uh, connections have uh, led right back into San Francisco. So this is true. It, this has been happening um, yeah, because of been Angora. Been um, I just got invited into a, a, a feature reading in New York that I never participated in before. See? Okay, so, uh, yeah. So Jennifer Genou, uh she's American. Anyway, so you're right. Angora is reaching out to Angora. Now we want you to reach out to Angora Dave and you're on. Okay, so here's the first one. It's called Absorb Us Despite Marijuana and Other Distractions. I let go momentarily and stepped outside for the briefest instant forever. The next morning, a woman was pulled from a river after a plane crashed into a bridge on live TV. That look upon her face outside. I was outside myself, me without my body, my mind. I came back inside, I knew outside. Reality came crashing in with the specter of destruction on the television set. An abundance of commentary on just what shit went down. Pretty ugly, imaginative stuff going on inside here. Okay. Okay. Don't abuse drugs. Watch your use of television. I don't know. Stay away from white sugar. Stay away from television. And flying is the safest way to travel, right? <laughs> Unless it goes wrong. So here's number two. Charcoal Rider's Day of Harmonics. Charcoal Rider writes away the day draws word pictures with the cold embers of the nighttime fire. Storytelling, wonder, memory, and conjuncture. Words written before in the distant past, near future visions of the new golden dawn. Charcoal writer pauses and recalls that first time he made love to his wife in eternity. Charcoal writer's philosophy, very simple, very simple, which is hard to remember 
in the chatterbox clashings of realities. Yes, in the wilderness, we were all really basic folk with gods and goddesses and space visitors and visions and the unceasing quiet of the awesome forest. Charcoal Rider was there, writing, ever writing, and telling the tale to the growing generations. The people left the forest and became fascinated with time. Charcoal Rider watched it all, wrote with a computer, videographed his visions while the chatterbox realities slushed around, confused in a gradual shift to a global consciousness, a return to the forest in the guise of his future self, space-faring explorer of the galaxy, predicted by the charcoal writer of all times far and wide, who, who hug and love the earth and all its material and the visions of his mind. Okay, that's, that's like a wrap. Okay, David, woo. We, we have to find out who Charcoal Rider is. <laughs> who is that masked man or woman? <laughs> uh, one thing that I really liked, uh, one thing that struck me, I thought was awesome in its um, pinpoint. Again, if you'll repeat that phrase about the, uh, the unceasing quiet in the forest. Yeah, it's the, oh, just went away from it. Hold on a second. Here we are. The line was, uh, ah, and the unceasing quiet of the awesome forest. Okay. It's, it's and it, the, both the quiet and the forest are large. <laughs> I got it, man. That's right. The, the, the presence of quiet, the, the presence of silence. And if you've what, ever what been it, out in the wilderness, we're really out there. And even with, I mean, it's silent, but there's all, all the noise of everything going on in the forest, too. So, yeah. yeah, sure. It's easier to listen to crickets than car horns. Remember that. <laughs> uh, well, I'm an urban boy, so urban man. So I get it when I go out into uh, screaming maniacs is what you're most likely to hear nowadays in an urban environment. But when I go in. When I go into the forest, because I'm a city dweller, I immediately go, wow, the awesome silence that's present, the terrible, that I can't take for granted because I don't have nearly enough of it. It's good for all of us to get some of that. Okay. How about your next one, Dharma? Uh, this will be number three, then. Three is a charm. A flow poem. Sunlight on a spring's day. Birds singing, crows cawing, Alan plays guitar. I sit here, finally relaxed a bit. I don't really care what happens. I am seeking a picture postcard view of what's going on. But lacking that, we'll settle for sitting on this patio, looking up at the twisted shapes of these trees. I don't really feel like writing about what's going on, about what's important, because the important thing right now is to just forget everything and be in some Zen state where everything is seen as if for the first time. What thing is this I have caught myself in? I began half-heartedly thinking I was writing a poem. And now I am not so sure. This thing seems to be in a state of flux between poem and grocery list with here an intriguing image 
but ever there a meaningless stretch of line. But lo, the meandering bamble of a rambling journey down the corridor of my half forgotten dream. For actually this week, I have taken myself out of service for some much needed repairs. And thus I shall not fear that the poem that I write be fuel for a fool for the woodman's fire. But no task ever seemed so cruel as the writing of an overgrown poem or the writing of a poem with nightmare ranges of structure, yet here and there an image like a gem shining forth in the wreckage of that monstrosity. It is hopeless to hope, to reap the benefit of every marble, that every fell into any storm drain, needles in haystacks and every hot blooded dream can be swallowed by guppies in summer puddles. E.E. E. Cummings was as much a poet as anyone. And Angora is just one measure of success. There is only time to let it flow. Whoa. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Dave, you're hot on that one. Uh, you have a lot of elements in that poem that resonate with the modernist, modern school of poetry that came out in the late 50s in New York. Frank O'Hara and others would talk about seemingly, but now commonplace meetings and settings, and then turn around and go, and then say something like, well, maybe it's all for naught. And they were good at saying, well, maybe this is a poem. And, well, it's not a poem. And then uh, the, the, one of the warm, women uh, uh, from the New York School said, uh, we want you to submit to this anthology of New York, the modern school, they called themselves, okay? And she said, I'll be glad to. I'm sorry I don't remember her name at the moment. And her poem goes, like yours said, there's nothing worse than an overgrown poem or something. She goes, I'm tired of going to boring poetry readings. I'm tired of hearing boring poets. I'm hearing tired of hearing poets repeat themselves as if they're chasing their own tales endlessly. <laughs> Maybe I don't have shit to say about this matter, but the coffee's good. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, you you struck me like that, man. And, and then you go off more ethereally than they do, but you struck me like that. I think you could really dig Frank O'Hara in the modernists. Oh, yeah. I'm a big Frank O'Hara fan, definitely. Yeah. Okay. And uh, right. some of those other people, too, I'm sure. Yeah. All right. All right, David. Well, keep up the work and congratulations on your participation in, you say, Revolutionary Poet. The Revolutionary Poets Brigade, that was one of Jack Hirschman's groups. Mm. And his people are carrying it on. Long, long live the legacy of Jack Hirschman. Indeed. The former poet laureate of San Francisco, among other things. And my friend, he stayed here with me in Paris. Okay. And, and he was a communist. He would like, we would want us to remind everybody of that. <laughs> he was, oh, Christ almighty. He was like, he was a Stalinist. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> he was a Stalinist. It's, I'm glad he wrote poetry in addition to Stalinism. <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> okay. Well then, thank you very much, Dharma Dave. And now we're going to come over to Paris now. Thank you, Dave. And so now, bringing you live from here in Paris, we have our poet and man that we call uh, Tough Love. He gained his nickname recently again. Tough Love, Bill Strangmeyer. Okay, Bill, you're on. Give us some of that tough love, baby. I'll do what I can, Mo. I'm weak as I am. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, all of the ones I have tonight are from a project I had of um, answering Isaac Denison. So there's a quote from her for each one. 
And this one is, I thought of those great, pure and beautiful things which say no to us, for why should they say yes to us and tolerate our insipid caresses? Oof. Sensory deprivation. So there I was and it was dark, well, black, I couldn't see a thing. And time went on unseen till once the magic mad began. I saw the colors that comprised the black, the waves that set the air a wing, the squiggly lines that helped the colors as they flowed and ran. And then the walls became transparent and I saw the other sides. Technician at his table, earphones on to hear and listen just to me. He was bored with the guinea pigs, like this God who has no guides, who sits in heaven just existing like an unpolluted sea. Then end over end, the bed began to spin and fall like Alice down the well until, back, until I came back to the place I was and through the wall, green light. It shed, gold, it shed a gold mandala on the wall and threw a new door in another wall wall came in an old and hooded woman pointing finger and I thought what is this white I cried out no from fear of the unknown and of my own and of my unknown soul and mind but if an ancestor or evil grandma say was her what was the law and was I kind that was a real experience all right okay. Sensory dep deprivation experiment in college Okay. All right. Well, if you're going to do sensory deprivation, that's the age to do it, right? Because you end up back on your feet when it's over, no? Yeah. Yeah. I thought about it for weeks afterwards. Okay. Uh, okay. Again, from Isaac Dennison. While we are young, the idea of death or failure is intolerable to us. Even the possibility of ridicule we cannot bear. But we have also an unconquerable faith in our own stars and in the impossibility of anything venturing to go against us. As we grow old, we slowly come to believe that everything will turn out badly for us and that failure is in the nature of things. But then we do not much mind what happens to us one way or the other. In this way, a balance is obtained. The ordinary. I'm trying to find myself in the depth of the wind. I'm looking for tracks on the schedule of shows. The things that they tell me seem to never ring true. Identity is something that's so hard to find. The thirst for my vengeance is never assuaged. They say if I do this, I'll never accept being me. But all I can think of is asking them why. All the old laughter should have me besieged. I think of our childhoods as innocent pawns and all that was done me went faultless and pure. And nothing is sure but assumptions that sear as I look for ID thefts to borrow or own. The validation that I seek is sold along with soap or tea and all the anguish just a prize to make me think I'm real. Okay, oof, all right. It's always good to hear a confessional. Yes. And number three, Billy, three is a charm. Okay. Another quote from Isaac Dennison. Indeed, my friend, while the fools could have done without us, we are dependent upon the fools for our better knowledge. Reminder. Protect the jewel, protect the gem the key to, and keep it clean of spite and sneers that help the dirt to cling to love. I reap the har harvest, scythe the grain of every field I dream about or try to wish away. The sins were not the ones they claimed. The holy writ was turned around and evil sought to change the gem. Protect the jewel, protect the gem and keep it clean of greed and power. Sin will bleed the conscience dry, sins they glorify, enforce and profit from. Long dead religions tempt and spoil the weak to kiss the devil's ass. The sins I feel are simpler though, the word not spoken, cold revenge, the weakness laughed at, strength denied, and all I felt when fleeing from the light. Protect the jewel, protect the gem and keep it clean of, of 
and keep it clean of fear in the dark. Okay, all right. Okay. So what's next on, what's next on your activity agenda, Bill? More poems, a, a public reading, um, somebody else? Well, I was I was just featured on uh, David Sirwa's uh, David David Sirwa's thing. Uh, I think that went over. That was right. fun. That was a good reading, Bill. Enjoyed that. Well, thanks, yeah. thanks David. And, and, and your fellow Angora, Jack Cooper, he's the featured reader on the next uh, Spoken World Paris with David oh, yeah. Sirwa. Yeah, I did. Talk about it. Go Angora's to... landing back and forth with. Uh, Stop. Sorry, I missed you, Bill. Oh, well. <laughs> I posted it on uh, on Facebook. Huh? Well, I never. That's interesting because I. Okay, all right. Uh, I didn't and, uh, get word of it. It got past me. And I'm also supposed to be featured in June uh, at the live one, uh, at the at the Chat Noir. Well, good. All right. Good for you. All right. Keep it up. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Now we're going to go. We're going to go some distance down to uh, Ghana and uh, call on Benedicta. Hello, Benedicta. Hi, Mo. Hello. Hope you're good. Okay, good. So, uh, what have you to uh, share with us tonight? As well, the time zone in mine or in the evening time zone now. So what do you got there, Benedicta? What do you want to yeah, share? Okay. okay, I want to share one of my published works. It was captioned Waging Peace. Okay. Then after that, I'll proceed with my monocus. I hope I'm audible. Well, were you published uh, this work? Were you published uh, in, in Ghana, in the States? Where, where would that be? Published I was that. published with the B-Zine. The B-Zine, yeah. Okay, that's good. Do you know their editor has joined the Angora Poets Group? So, uh, glad to oh, have I you know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, B-Zine, people, B-Zine, not just for the arts and humanities, uh, is it, a really nice yeah. uh, online uh, poetry and other arts publication, the B-Zine. Okay, Benedicta, uh -huh. we're listening. Here we go from you. Okay, so I read An assimilated dart, unsustained long standing insurgencies, the sequelae of ambient and peculiarity in loads of mishaps and dynamism, seeping and entrenched, an unrest of sustenance. Stability has a rare affluence on significant shoes left in the dark. Peace can only stay when there's a joint act of benevolence. The air that surrounds an apneic state of no riots, breathless and proportionate, the heaps of unsettled upheavals, mm -hmm. revolt of unfairness in the time of undeserving messless acts devolved and presented in a predominant maneuver. It hits like a collective pulse of pain. It hits with an error of silence. It hits with tentative overlooked and unconcerned chance. It hits with a creeping creed of pain. It hits like the past, yields with no dividends, the packs of life, a time to wage peace from obscurities an austed onset of the past. That will be the first one. All right. Okay. Applause, Mita. It hits, Benedicta. It hits. And your reference to people um, identifying ethnically and, and then that breaking the uh, mutual willingness for peace. Yeah, that hits. That hits. We're in a time of ethnic Thank nationalism. You. Okay. So hit us with number two. Benedicta. So number two, is, number two is a monoku. And I read, remnants of a cloistered past. I take it again, remnants of a cloistered past. That's the second one. Mm -hmm. 
That was the second Monoko. Yes. Yes, it was good. Thank you. You're welcome. Then the third one, I read, in the vague distance, lying lifeless, life becomes a snatch, an undated, an unseen quest for the unknown. Standing still, I see all lives matter. That would be the last one. That would be that would be very nice. Thank you. Uh, what what I'd like to ask you is, um, I was re you read a full length poem tonight, and you most never read us full length poems. Are you about writing full length poems at this time, or have you been keeping them from us? I've been keeping them from you. Oh, I have more. <laughs> okay, well, it, I'm uh, among others on this screen. I'm curious to also to hear your full length poems as well as your monocles. So, and just like Beezing Magazine was curious enough to publish you, I think we would benefit hearing from your poems. Oh, thank you. I'm flattered. Mm. Okay. I sent my anthology anyway, so you could ask Caroline about it. Oh, good. I've already sent it. Good. Send one. Send your poems to Angora, and Angora Anthology at gmail dot com. Uh, Caroline Caroline is now collecting them since Muriel disappeared off our radar, um, and didn't even didn't even say why. Just boom! I want to collect all your connections and your poetry and I'll do something and then after she got all the connections and the poets phew, that was not cool not cool at all anyway good luck to her <laughs> all right so I am the uh, final poet of this round and um, first I want to read uh, I want to take the risk of reading you just simply some meanderings in no way Things I write on my lap while I'm on the metro. Okay, so here it goes. Uh, and it goes, Stormy Monday shows on Sunday and Tuesday, I'll get lost. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. Even the shadows show your outlines. If a black cat has nine lives, People, I've used eight. That's why I'm laughing and crying at all the wrong times. I'll be damned if I do the will, the won't, the do, do, do's, the don't. Yeah, you can be born on a bad sign on those side of the tracks with holes in my shoes and holes in my plan but moving ahead anyway on gusts of wind through empty pockets. So you try to do it, you try to make it, you try to make it compared to what? This thinking could make coffee nervous. But this, if this living don't kill me, I'll live till I die. Now, what is the meaning of life? A meaningful life. Out the bedroom window, down the drain pipe, through the backyard gate, and over the wall, my first escape. Now I can keep walking, and I can dance. I can get lost in a look, or looking at a river. You don't really want to get found. The name of the game is to keep moving on. That's it. That's not me entering that. Okay. Now, Good. Oh, thank you. Just me entering. I like to write them. Uh, then it is more serious than I am. You know, it's an it. It's an exercise for me in realizing the it is to be taken more seriously than myself. 
it's actually being a writer, you want to focus on yourself in order for you to produce whatever you say. So it's a great irony, it's a great paradox. But given, uh, given the nature of what we're talking about tonight, about a tough love and denying shenanigans and facades and things like that, uh, I'll go back and give you this poem called, I give you my word, I seek no high place among you, take comfort as I offer none. Comfort is the sleep of dull dreams. I share you nightmares, radio fuck at 4 a.m. running through my head. It's not safe here on an honest night. Safety is for the complacent. Why don't we take sanctuary and witness those drowning in the empty vessels of themselves? I came to comfort the disturbed, to disturb the comfort. Listen to the poet. You have nothing to fear but the truth itself. Ted Jones said that. We must look behind. We must see the shadow of the past. We must mute ourselves on the screen right now so I can continue this poem. Laura. We must look behind and see the long shadows of the past. Dirty saints, bloody angels on my best day. Step beside yourself, go out in the rain, get wet with what is. I am not your entertainer, not your menstrual show poet. I am not here to look cute with Belgian chocolates for the painter's exposition. I am here to hear the poet who will defy the high priest, who will ask, where are the intellectuals? And when all hell breaks loose again, hiding in their academies, I would have you hear the poet who reveals the dirty secrets. The poet will stand between you and your slavers. This could be your rightful mission. Be that poet, keep the beat on the pulse of life. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm gonna read. Lovely. Thank you. Now I'm gonna read one that I read last week, but we're being recorded. Um, and uh, this is a poem that I presented to a Russian delegation during the period of uh, Perestroika. And they asked, a folk singer, a noted folk singer, and me as a poet to receive this delegation publicly, and the mayor of this of our city in Pittsburgh. That's how it went that day. I want to read this now because uh, I think we need before what's called the left crumbles into blind nationalism. Like in other words, to put down that dictator Putin, we don't care if the Russian people starve. We don't care if you trigger a nuclear war so you can sell arms to Ukraine. So here's my poem. Because so many perished in ships en route to Ellis Island, because so many perish now on the plain before the Rio Grande, because so many perished at Stalingrad, at Bobby, Bobby Yor, because so many perished in the ghostly gulag, because so many perished in the Middle Passage. And I smell the, the burnt, stench of flesh in pools of cold-blooded Mississippi. Was moist enough. It's possible. Because bread tastes no difference to the hungry, and wheat no preference from which field it gleams from. Milk is white, honey brown, rain is crystal clear. Because the golden sun passing through an azure sky halts for no checkpoints. No barricades, no man's borders. Was Moishio. It's possible. Because bullets never sing patriotic anthems as they tunnel the flesh of a human being. Because dead men cease to curse each other. And the worms don't distinguish the winners from the losers. Because the harbingers of death varnish our minds 
their toxic tongues, their brains gone hard, their hearts are harder, there's ignorance, there's fear, there's hate. Varnished upon a nuclear nose cone destined to kill you so suddenly, you will not have time to hear me cry as I die a megaton second after. Have you and I ever been ours? What's more? Because I know that your children dream as my children do under the same starry sky. And darkness is a time of rest, not fear of the dawn. Because I want to die old in the field, she in the garden, he on the sunny side of the porch. Because life, like a river, rushes forward when free to run its natural course until the day it gracefully surrenders to the sea. Was more so. Okay, well, those were, that ends our first round. That was a hell of a first round. Everybody thank everybody. Let's uh, take ourselves a brief break and come back and um, contribute two pieces in the second round. Okay. Goma, I want to speak to you. Here we are now starting our second round of Angora Poets, the World Cafe. And it's my pleasure to call on for the second round, our poet from Harlem, who published his uh, Get Around, very popular book, I Didn't Come Here to Tap Dance, uh, Ngoma. Please, Ngoma Hill, give us two. Okay. This one didn't make the book, but I just figure, I figure I read it anyway. It's called, uh, his daddy should have used a condom. It said God made everything. God don't like ugly. God don't make mistakes. Maybe God assigned some projects to his assistant. Cause I don't want to blame God for some of the crap on the planet. For example, let's check out R. Kelly. What's up with his sickness for little girls? Somebody should get him drunk and cut his pecker off. Now, Dr. Cliff Huxtable is okay with me. But his alter ego, AKA Bill Cosby, I got problems with him, buddy. And I wasn't around when it happened. And I think he was set up for a takedown, but all them women couldn't be lying. And I remember when dropping quaaludes and knocking boots was the rage. So there's more to this than skeletons in the closet. Now about Kanye, that boy needs help. He's got enough cash to hire a good publicist. I think that Kardashian Poonani is poisonous. He should choose better company and see a doctor. I really believe that Michelle's mama had root work done in the White House. That's why the tweeter in charge can't keep a cabinet. They're leaving, his, they're re leaving like roaches from real kill. His lawyers need lawyers. Everything he touches turns from gold to shit. Everything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. He's crazier than the one who flew over the cuckoo's nest. And the bottom line is his daddy should have used a condom. Or maybe his mama should have swallowed. I'm just saying, maybe God shouldn't have given free will. Everybody can't handle it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <Woo. laughs> I bet you got some people thinking, like some women in the house saying, yeah, he's right. <laughs> Yeah. Let me invite him back for a night over. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, you can stay this weekend. I'll, I'll take you back. <laughs> oh, God. And show you what happens. when you. Yeah, yeah. That's wild. Man, that's right. Maybe she should have <laughs> cut off his pecker. <laughs> you know, in mental health, they've tried therapy. They've tried medication. Right. And a lot of these perverts just, I'm sorry, they just don't reform. You don't so, get it. So, you know, at least they're still alive without the tool that drives them to abuse people. <laughs> so anyway, so this one comes from, from the book. Okay. Uh, I didn't come here to tap dance. It's a poem that I wrote after my uh, first trip to Nigeria. Mm. Return to the source. 
Eshu opened the way. Ogun cleared the path. Degungun sent me back to the source, back to the root instead of the branch. 27 Babalawos in Ibadan, Ianifa to bring balance. Oshun's river through Oshogbo, the holy land, the holy city of Ileife, Yoruba land, tin roof city, overflowing with oil and poverty, rich in spirit and mystery. Women balancing lives on their heads, endless speeding motorbikes, overcrowded trucks and minivans, highways flooded with peddlers who bring anything you can ask for to the window of your car, corrupt government officials, crooked cops with AK-47s hustling Naira, the hypnotic sway of lapas, the alarm clock of roosters, the beauty of ebony African people defying cosmopolitan's false standards, tribal scars, asking whose civilization and what would Webster know anyway as the veil was lifted to the initiated, secrets written in binary codes, supreme mathematics and opuele and cowrie shells, ancient rhythms passed from hand to heartbeat, destiny revealed in DNA, each day bringing lessons to be learned in this school of life. Okay. All right. I have a question to ask you. You went to Nigeria, you went to, uh, as you, uh, to Nigeria. People yeah. have reported, okay, here we go. Uh, Black Americans have reported what it's like simply being in Africa. Do you have an expression of what you were like or felt simply being in Africa? And well, in this case, Nigeria? Yeah. <laughs> uh, not just Nigeria, but Africa, period. Because I had have, I have been to other parts of Africa before I went to Nigeria. And it just seemed like, hmm. It just seemed like you belong. It's just, it's just amazing to see a place that's just run with black people, <laughs> you know, and people treat you really well, like you know, welcome home. Those that know, not not everybody, but both time, especially when I went to Nigeria. When I went to Nigeria, I didn't just go to hang out. I, I went to be initiated as a priest of Obatala. And so I got all this respect that, that you don't get here. Um, young people do things like mm, they bow to you. I don't mean like bow like this. I mean like lay out on the ground. <laughs> so it was, it's, it was a whole different, whole kind of real different kind of experience. You know, and I was kind of like, wow, you know, <laughs> for <Okay>. me. <laughs> May I say that that I, years ago, I listened to what Richard Pryor and Muhammad Ali uh, said as to the same question. What was it like as you as a black American in Africa? And they said what you said. Hmm. Uh, I, I remember Pryor saying, wow, everybody, I was just part of everybody. First time in my life, I was just part of everybody. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and he said, although people didn't know, a lot of people didn't know I was Richard Pryor, it didn't matter. <laughs> it was black on black on black on black. Right. And that was a new sensation for me. And Muhammad yeah. Ali said the same thing. You know, he said, you know, and, and in some of his quips, you know, uh, he did something similar to like, uh, no African ever called me an N-word, you know. And, yeah, 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 yeah. And, but, um... and that in itself was just so in fact, emancipating the way they described it. The other thing is you, you, you see people that look like people in your family, like, like, like somebody that lived down the street. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's, that's my boy. He used to live across the street. You're like, no, that's, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> as a teenager, I was in Europe and I walked up to people. I remember and said, hey, brother, what time's this train come? Because I can't figure it out. <laughs> and this dark skinned man turned around and said, was this das <laughs> Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I, I would <laughs> aren't you from the East Coast? <laughs> <It's the> coast. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my naivete, you know. All right. Thank you. Can we hear number two in Goma? 
Oh, I thought I did number two. That was did number two. Was that number two? Yeah, number one was um was the thing um that is you yeah. use the condom, and number two was returning to the source. So that's okay. Number. All right. Well, my I have limited storage capacity on my hard drive. So <laughs> <laughs> I make these memory mistakes uh, often. Well, thank you, Angoma. Thank you very much. And uh, reminding people that they can go to, where can they go to get your book? I go to Lulu. Go to Lulu, people. Go to Lulu. I'll, put, I'll try to put it in the chat. Let me see what I can do. Okay. All right. So now, after uh, we're down here next to Laura. Hello, Laura. You're back with us. Okay. This is called Concerto de Pianti. The master of ceremonies calls, hear ye, hear ye, get gone, ye men of Adam. Now stand, you grand red walls, stand, you velvet seats, stand, you golden balconies, and bow as you green gratefully with 2,292 perspiring plantae, respiring residents, vegetal visitors, guests fresh from the vivifying vegetable kingdom. The opera house resembles rainforest, while on stage the human quartet begins Puccini's elegy, Chrysanthemy. The glinting cello frowns forth as viola and violins weave wreaths in air, their sad strings felling tears to roots absorbing the elder tender tale, while maidenhair fern fronds fondly sway somber drapery, ponytail palms nod in helpless mimicry. Have you seen the jade plant's stolid face? The philodendron gathers close, the elephant leaf leans an ear, the peace lily bows to bear, the aloe vera bleeds teethy mascara. Ooh. All dream momentarily of chimera, chimera ephemeral, then hear instead the soft steps of life's sweet leaving, the soft hard stones of quiet taking, like rain's quick dashed play across the cobbled streets of life until at end, expiration, respiration, shout the plant fans in celebration, then gasp in silent waiting station. The musicians bow low, the red walls stand, the velvet seats sway, the balconies growl. Now watch, the homo sapiens run. The walls, seats, balconies hum, hear ye, hear ye, Green cornucopia brought from strife, stride proud, ye new mu musicians to fight for life. The instruments on stage rest innocent, eloquent, and coquette. There is a buzz from the assorted vegetation, a pause, and then the jade plant rises, marches methodical to organize his kind. The Schefflera bends his back to lift along the spine. The Sanseveria snakes along, transporting friend and vine. A new quartet invade the stage. The elephant ear slides the bow across cello. The ponied palm extends her tail. The maiden hair cradles her violin like kin. The philodendron waves his viola near. Comes the hush and then rhythm, harmony, melody, lush, verdantly plant painting a view of the springing leafy sward, the sunny meadowed hill, the shadowed wooded glen, ushered on by the cacao and passion flower jungle, the creosote and prickly pear of desert terrain, the lichen, moss, and forbs of mountain alpine the mint and rose of coastal strands supine, the pale armed birch, elephant legged beech, and bearded old oak of thicket, copse, and grove. The sway and strains sally, the notes dance strong, a river riddles, surges forth. Sullied past be gone, new life begun, no hesitation, respiration, respiration, Pant the plants in exultation. 
<laughs> okay, Laura. All right, now I have a question. Are you celebrating the the consciousness and presence of all these plants, or sometimes you condescending? Because when you sit here, come the they're in their vegetable state, but later, you, that's what I'm asking. Oh. Are you um, celebrate? Are your metaphors? Yes. You know? No. I. Well, I mean, plants don't think of vegetal as bad, Mo. Okay. <laughs> well, well I, I'm. I'm. I, I, I. I'm celebrating. It was a revolution of the plants taking over the stage. Okay. Good. Okay. I just want to ask you that because in the beginning we we used the word. You know, he's a vegetable that it connotes the connotation is pejorative is negative yeah. so uh, doing on tonight what is doing on tonight i don't know <laughs> all right getting back to you laura um that was nice and what was that out of milan are you talking about to milan or, or the venice that was, that was out of um La Scala. I think it was in, wasn't it in Spain where they had the... I'm asking the, you, where you envision that going no, on. Yeah, this was in the early part of the pandemic lockdowns in Spain, they filled an opera house with plants. Wow. And, and then they played chrysanthemum to the plants. Wow. And there was okay. a picture of this Spanish uh, opera house beautifully you know beautiful architecture and just decorations and then here it was full of a jungle of green plants and it was sort of reddish and gold the decorations so of the opera was this, house. A this was a manner by which not to spread covid i don't know um <laughs> i can no longer remember but i sort of thought well the plants you know, just like everything stopped and the birds started singing louder and the plants yeah. looked, looked better. And I, right. I, I sort of okay. thought, I think the plants are, are coming back and look, they're even playing, you know, performances just to plants. A after and, and, that and was your, over. And your, okay. And they, you're mentioning one of the greatest composers in Western history, Puccini. Yes. I could listen to Puccini day and night. He is just, okay. Well, thank you. Now, you have number two? No, no, I only did one because it's long. Okay, well, I want to thank you for that. Okay, all right. Okay, now we have someone on board who, uh, uh, I don't know anybody named Infinix Smart. Would you like to tell us who you are? And unmute, please. Well, you're still muted. If you can hear me, put your name in the chat box if you can't get your audio on, so we know who you are. Type your name in uh -huh. our chat box. Ah, oh, there you are. Hello. Hello. Yes, hello. Can you hear me now? Very well. I'm Huda. I'm Huda El Shelly, my friend. I'm Huda. Yes. It's been a long time, Huda. Good to see you back. Nice, and I forgot your tag, Infinity. Right, that's your tag. Yeah. Are, are you are you in Morocco this evening? Yeah, I'm in Morocco, and I'm so happy to be with you tonight. I did my best to join. Yes, well, we're glad to have you, and oh, you're in time. You're in in good time to read with us tonight. So um, we'll get to you very soon in fact it's okay 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 thanks okay so uh next next on my list all right who who was next all right who was next in this order after uh, okay huda everybody we're going to go to san francisco now and we're going to bring on uh uh david here rorschach or dharma dave as we call him dharma you're back on hello how, how great, uh, wonderful. Okay, so round two, so here are two. Uh, the first one is called Quincy. Boom, woodcutter, run. The afternoon is sunlight on melting snow. Breeze of pleasure ruffling by and by the people's faces. 
reflecting smiles and eyes, green grass and gravel in the streets and a slow pace to life. Birds and children play in yards, dogs yawn and scratch in the shade. Easy going, long haired imported freaks laugh and drink, smoke joints, talk about last year's parties. And me, Bay Area refugee, with pretty bubbling girl by my side, accepting handshakes and greetings in this poetry birthing canyon of all my quiet dreams and inmost quests. Oh, how nice. Wow. Nice. No fuss, no muss, no stress. That was nice. Thank you, Dharma. That was a Thumbs fun weekend. It. <laughs> okay, number two from you. Okay, this one goes a little bit, a little bit broader, maybe. It's a firebird from the fire's ashes. The phoenix shall rise again. Phoenix, life, death, and rebirth. Broken hearts around broken fires. Were you once a druid? I have seen your eyes dark in the firelight. These trees cast weird shadows. Have you seen the shaman dancing, arms flying? The flames lick about his waist, chanting, chanting, chanting. I've seen your eyes dark in the firelight. The flame bird rises up all at once alive. That which dies can live again. Oh, the stories I could tell about countless descents, and reascents, but my memories are clouded. There is a lock upon my mind and shackles on my heart. How I wish that I could burst them and rise up again like a phoenix, all golden and red, bathed in flame. The stars were different then, beneath the druid fire. Were you there? Some of that light seems to reflect from your eyes. Could the phoenix leap again out of the fire into the full bloom of memory? Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for speaking, all right. Okay, number two. No, that oh, was, that two. was number two from you. <laughs> You're right. Wow. Okay, let's give it up for Hope in the Phoenix, huh? Yeah. Yes. Okay, down but never out. Huh? We're down against yeah. the odds. We, st we stay we, in the we game. We carry on. We, we still yeah, persist. Yeah, we do. Okay, <laughs> so now we're going to come back here to Paris and we're going to feature again uh, Bill Stragmeyer, who uh, it was on in our first round, and uh, here we go, Bill. It's over to you. Thank you. Okay, again, a quote from Isaac Dennison. But what if the king should say, Madam, there is not much sense in rope dancing. It is a rough performance. I'm going to stop it. What sort of performance on the part of the king should that be to me? Trial period. As if on a train or an ox cart or a tumbrel, as if a passenger but not a charioteer, I see that those who once rode with me now have gotten down. The once familiar babies, girls and boys now pushing on or pulling oxen, slaves or genies or just brute hallucinations within a changing scene almost unseen. Inside a train, it once was, sometimes not, sometimes like a food cart down an aisle 
or in a painting from my grandma's parlor, faded countryside in paint of German drab. And sometimes under dark black water, clean and black, disoriented, sterile of all fish and all biota, <clears throat> but clearly forced channel run beneath the sky so rarely noted there from down within black water. More often than for sometimes years, a city street, a country road, a boardroom table, pool hall, mating room, meeting room, a party, festival bar, festival or bar. But lately and at night, there is a door that flickers tempting in and out of mist. It's made of mist and iron and of oak. I know what lies behind that door for I have dreamt of that wide vista, a season real as childhood, vivid as a film. But still I fear that door as I still fear that joy, or rather I mistrust the promise, every promise made in this Champlay imposed upon desire by the woeful God of glory from the pulpit of the musty church of least resistance and then written into law. But worry not, don't think about it, for it's not as if we share a common fate. Mm. Okay, all right. <laughs> Okay. That's what made. okay, number two, Bill. <clears throat> From Isaac Dennison. He wanted to be happy, but he had no talent for happiness. He had suffered during his youth. As time went on, a dreadful thing had happened to him. One thing had become to him as good as another. Political doggerel faked correction. Mm. And what will we talk about? What will we say when the wonder thuds silently onto the floor like our clothes on the first night of the nick? On the, ah, let me start again. And what will we talk about? What will we say when the wonder thuds silently onto the floor like our clothes on the first night the nakedness bloomed? You look at the future with your eyes glowing bright and I look at the, and I look at past losses with grit in my eyes, though we're not John Dunn's compass and have plenty conceit. Stepping out of my sandbox is always the same with older, much younger or foreign or tame for the reasons revealed in our different local neuroses and jokes. Now people are kind to their own kind, it's true, for the talking of cultures, what passes for brains, and politically nice and correct is a game that needs chumps who will lose. Just the same as the evil old codger still ruling the world using hipness or money to make you be cool, should I say, or be only the infantry leading the way to destroy any trace of the one or the all. Oh, Oh, the war between Satan and the thing we call God is a farce based on horm hormones and status and class that is played out each moment we walk around wakened and kicked in the ass. And the winner's the one with a pointed steel glint in the eye who can parse his profession to make you think, why am I only a this? Am I only a that in this wonderful world he's just pulled from his hat? Have I answered your question, exposed your dismay, or just claimed that the playpen's a castle of codes built to keep me a beggar, a siege of the world's richest goods and delights? But I care, and I care with a passionate longing for justice and truth that the preachers and hipsters refer to as laughable lack to their, of their pelf. Mm. And I wonder if maybe they're right, or am I? For I feel many gears of the culture machine, although rust is the product the two facile thinkers now feel they produce from their softness so fierce. Oof. Beware, beware, people. Well, at least, at least we have the sanctuary and often the solitude of being poets and not puppets. So I feel you on that. All right, Bill, thank you for the tough love. Why do we call you tough love, Bill? <laughs> okay, now we're going to move down uh, across the water, down to Ghana, and uh, re-invite Benedicta from Ghana. Benedicta, hello. Hi, Mo. All right, Benedicta. We're waiting to listen to you now. Okay, so I have two monocles for you. Okay. So I'll take the first one. 
I read, connections of passionate resilience with the sense of humor. I take it again. Connections of passionate resilience with a sense of humor. That's the first one. Yeah, that's a desirable relationship. Thank you. Number two, please. An obliged paraphrase, those in inclined curiosity. I take it again. An obliged paraphrase, those in inclined curiosity. That will be all. Okay, that will be nice. Okay, Benedicta. Very nice. And I remind you that Benedicta has been published in the B BZ, not just for arts and humanity, in print and online. So look up BZ, not just for arts and humanity. Not just for arts and humanity. Strange title, but a very, very good, very good uh, creative arts site. And Benedicta is featured in the current one. Okay, Benedicta, thank you. And, uh, You're most welcome. Okay. And and now I want to uh, come on with somebody we haven't seen for a while here on Angora Poets. And I'm glad that she joined our Angora Poets Facebook group so she can get a direct communications to us. And also, as we do, we contribute things on that um, Facebook group. It's called Angora Poets World Cafe meaning uh, some people drop in what they're doing next as a performance or what they published lately. Uh, people talk back and forth to one another and it's just between us. So that's nice too. So having said that, I want to invite our, our poet and writer and journalist friend from Morocco, Huda. All right, Huda, you're on, welcome back. Well, now we got to get you to unmute. Okay, okay. You there hear you me? Are. It's okay? Now we hear you very well. Okay. So before you go on, I want you to tell us a little bit, what are you doing lately? Because uh, you haven't been on board with us, so we haven't heard your news in a while. Mm -hmm. So tell us what you're into lately. Oh, so many things at the same time, you know, um, kids, family, uh, work, uh, writing, uh, columns for newspapers, translating, interpreting, so many things at the same time. Okay. <laughs> That's why I have joined. That's why I, I bet uh, you, you must know that I, uh, it's always a pleasure to be with you to come back to you and to poetize with you. Well, thank you. And I, for one, <clears throat> follow what you write in that journal that, is it a newspaper, in fact? It's a critical journal, no? I've been writing in different newspapers and I'm writing columns mainly in French, not in English. Yes. I right. wrote for newspapers here in Morocco and for a newspaper in France, um, well, last year it was a newspaper in France, another one in Morocco, and this year I'm writing for a newspaper in Morocco. Okay, now I have a question. Uh, it was announced tonight um, that uh, Emmanuel Macron has won the presidency of France for a second term. Uh, what was the general feeling in Morocco leading up to the election? Well, you know, any it was expected, we expected Macron to win. All Moroccans, the majority of course, uh, only don't want Le Pen to be, to be, to, to, of course, to be president. Um, Macron, we have so many things to say about Macron, but anyway, since it's not Le Pen, it's, uh, it's nice. <laughs> okay, yeah. That, that was the sentiment where I was at eight o'clock when it was announced. People were saying, oh, Macron, you know, what a shyster, what a hustler, you know, what an arnaque. But he is not Le Pen. So uh, people were relieved. I think you, uh, you, you agree with me. You don't want Le Pen uh, to be president. 
don't you? No, not no. I don't want to see a civil. No, of course not. I don't. <laughs> of course not. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in this this session, I listened to her father one time. Her father, Jean Marie Le Pen, father, in a press yeah. con in a press conference in Paris, mm. and he didn't have media savvy like his daughter. He yeah. just came out and gave neo Nazi uh, yeah. talk and said he denied the Holocaust. He denied that Hitler and the Nazi war machine did so much damage. Uh, he supported. He said the French benefited from collaborating. That's what I heard him say in a press conference. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, anyway, for tonight, what would you like to contribute by way of a couple pieces? How many points um, do I have uh, to read? Well, give us two first, since yeah. you missed the first round and you're overworked. We can go for three, okay. Okay. because in the first round we asked for three. Yes, I will read two poems now. Uh, now uh, okay. Yes. Just a minute, please. I lost the page. Mm -hmm. I lost it. Okay. No, not, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Take a minute. It happens. Yeah, of course. I lost the page. I had it, but hmm. well. know me, know me. Uh, I'm going to read a poem uh, entitled Know Me. Okay. Now take my whole and analyze it. See how complex and simple I am. Explore my details. Let them tell you about the places I have been to. I am those places. Take my pieces one by one. Scrutinize them. Listen to them calling names of friends and enemies, of lovers and haters. I am those names. Sing my song. Allow yourself a trip in my tunes. Echo the lyrics with your voice and feel them deep in your heart. I am those lyrics and I am those tunes. Approach my garden, smell the fragrance of its tiniest plants, breathe the freshness of its air. I am those plants, I am that air. Look at my eyes, contemplate their color, listen to the message their color sends. I am that message. Read my book page by page and then reread it each word alone. Spell my words on your paper and see what they say. I am those words. Taste my drink, feel its heat, gaze at its black at its blackness and smell its flavor, fly to its source. I am that source. Well, this is my first poem. Okay. Um, I'm impressed with that poem. Applause meter is up. <laughs> that was so visual and sensual. And that was nice the way you, you put the various touches to it, vis visual and sensual like that. Very, very nice. Okay. Thank you so and, and you're doing it in English because you mostly write poetry in French, right? Would I be right about that? I'm, I mostly write poetry in English. I have three three uh, collections, three poetry collections in English. Uh, oh. The last one, this one, uh, was edited in uh, in the United States in Florida. Mm -hmm. This is the last one. It's called the the Edge of the Blue, the Edge of the Blue, and. Nice. Uh, and uh, my fourth collection is in French. 
It's called Femme Écrite. Written women. Written yeah. women. Femme yeah. Écrite. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Isn't it? It, geez, do you ever sleep? Yes. Do you sleep? <laughs> It happens with me. <laughs> I do a lot, and you make me look like I'm a reticent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let's hear your next one. Let's hear your next piece. Yes, of, of course. Um, lost again. <laughs> <laughs> There's one poem I want to read, and <laughs> I don't find it. You were? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I will come back to one okay. poem, to, to one poem which is in the, in the first pages. Uh, cockroaches dance. Cockroaches dance, okay. Yes. Page, I think, 17. Okay. Um, this poem, uh, I wrote it about time. Uh. And who the hell said time was only a tick and talk issue? Who said it was a dull lost rhythm? Who said it was crazy words scattered in the memory, in the memory and the mirror of the dark pose of our pale skins? Who said time? was only a unit that measured our sick days, our fury, our blood, and the infinite scope of our frivolity. Who the hell said time was the demon that dwelled in our bodies just to boost our animosity to life and to the living? Who said time penned our stories with its past dirty ink and took out plots, took our plots away from us. Who said time stole our soulfulness and turned it into ticking and tucking bloody, -ish, bloody ends that perpetually called for the earth's final breath every now and then. Who said? We weren't shaped like a long hand running one after another. In a flying cockroach's horrible dance over the ancient colorless shelves of a huge nafty cook. Who said time wasn't that and worse? Who said we weren't that and worse? Who said we were and who said we are? Yeah. Mm. All right. Time gets a bad mm. rap if you go deeper. All right. You're the yeah. second poet who landed on the concept of being in time tonight. You and, and, yeah. and, and Dharma Dave. It's great. Okay. Wow. Who said, right. And a question who said, uh, most people go, you're right. Who did say that? Who, who did that? say, you know, <laughs> and I, and like yourself, I think somebody opened up that whole uh, demonic uh, transformation, and that was William Shakespeare. He talked yeah. a lot about that as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, your next one, please. Huda, give us oh, another one. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I yeah, the poet. Yeah, let's read the poet. The poet. <clears throat> To be a poet, you should pen your words with the weirdest ink ever, over wild flowers' petals, and sing along with the sweetest sounds of butterflies' wings fluttered. To be a poet, you should close your eyes to see what's hidden and have goosebumps each time love is said, sung are written. To be a poet, you should doubt the concrete, search for the flu, and always question both in cold and heat. To be a poet, you should love your solitude, 
dive in the absolute and never wish to quit, for it's only there that you'd feel you could fit. To be a poet, you should fly to the infinite, meet with the indefinite and never descend again. To be a poet, you should seek the divine even in your ugliest states and under the grounds and over the hates. To be a poet, you should catch the times, you should catch the limits between the blues, greens and whites far in the distant skies. To be a poet, you should talk to the tiniest creatures around and be amazed by the subtle that makes them refined. To be a poet, you should dare to sit on the edge of life and take all risks to observe, to observe and to absorb what will come next. To be a poet, you should belong to outer worlds and the music of your words should echo the vibes of those charming unseen resorts. To be a poet, you, your soul should have a voice of her own and your heart should be able to sing its uncommon refrain every now and again. Okay, every now and again, <laughs> that's, that's it. <laughs> oh, wow, thank you. Wow, what a great, that's a manifesto in poetry. I like that. I can agree to that. That's a, that's challenging. It's daring. It, it would make me so, feel, and I love a couple of things. You, I love a lot of things you said, and I particularly like to be a poet, you sit on the edge of life. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, like if I'm really going to be a poet, whether I'm as good as, better than, not, whatever, just as you say, live in your poetude. Live in your poetude. Exactly. That doesn't have rank. That doesn't have hierarchy. That has essence of poet. Of I like that so much. Yeah. And to live on the edge of life. Because uh, every time I get matching furniture, I'm quickly disillusioned because matching coffee mugs or matching furniture just remind me that it what was all that about? <laughs> you know, I'm, I remember being told that we could, when I was married very young, we could buy matching furniture, Mo, with that money you're making, my wife asked me. We were in our early 20s. I understand that. We were both working class, you know. You could, but we could buy matching furniture, maybe Broyhill. And I turned around and said, Linda, we could go to the Middle East. <laughs> that's that's where we were planning. She's anyway. That was a big rupture right there. I knew was coming. That would be uh, evident and symbolic of more differences. I'm on the edge here. I don't care about matching furniture. Uh, anyway, that was great. Thank you very much. And I hope that in your very busy schedule, because I know on Sundays in the past you've talked about. Um, uh, visiting your mother, visiting your family? Uh, my mother passed away some three, two years ago. So it's been that long. Okay. Remember, we met you before COVID. Yeah. No, not. Yes, before COVID, before COVID. That, and I was so busy. with. There were so many things to handle at the same time. Yeah. I wasn't trying to give you remind you of a bad memory as much as to say, I remember you were saying, I'm on Angora now, thank you. I've made four stops today and I have another appointment soon and I'm gonna read anyway. <sighs> Let me get a breath. And, and like I would do, you did too. Where did I put that damn poem? Now, <laughs> now that I've done all this huffing and puffing to get here, where's my poem? <laughs> that would be me on many occasions. Okay, well, thank you again. Um, we're always glad to welcome back uh, welcome. people welcome them back and uh, wow i guess it's my turn now to close this session because we are wrapping up with me as the last post uh in uh 
the second round. So what I'm going to do now is uh, do a poem uh, that was inspired and directly inspired. I unabashedly talk about it by Cesar Pavesi. Cesar Pavesi, the Italian, wonderful Italian poet. And so uh, it was inspired by him. And uh, you can hear his influence on me. And I have no, nothing but pride to say it exists. Anyway, here we go. This is simply called The Cat Will Know. Rain will fall again on your cracked pavement. A light rain, like a breath or a step you take. Rain like truth will fall everywhere. After the onyx night, the dawn will raise you among bowlers and butterflies in the face of this coming spring. There will be other days and other voices in your head, bold and new, soon to grow old and pass away like a costume left over from last night's party. My voice absent, but for the hum of jazz. You will make gestures to invite, answer them in words that you've known before. In the face of darkness and rain, you will not retreat from fire and truth, stating like you did, all that eludes you, holding fast to a shared silence. We both come forth and be. Who will care? Who will listen in? Oh my, the cats will know. So that's the cats will know. Okay. And here's a poem I wrote to somebody. Um, as you said, uh, uh, who to be a poet. Well, I wrote to someone who was asking me for uh, encouragement. And uh, they had all these dreams, fantasies, uh, uh, to do things beyond their conventional life. And so after a while, you try to share with somebody. But uh, as we all know, one has to do it for oneself, you know. And it's a fool's game to think that one can design somebody into an artist. Anyway, this is called Flight, and this is what I wrote back. Flight, look. Look into me, into my eyes. See? Designs, castles built. Oh, the roof caves in. Battles fought. The wounds. How I always laugh and cry at the wrong times. Kisses, kisses dripping blood hot. Loyuza, come in. Know for yourself mysteries, animal satiation. Chaos theory, but a hint of what's to come. You may hold my hand as we flee the tyranny of the straight line. Fire never burns itself. Water does not drown. Wind never gets lost in flight. Now look. Look at you. Licking your wounds. Stretching your limbs. Smelling the danger. Letting it go. The blood in your veins. The cocktail adrenaline. Hormones and laughter. Look. There you are. See yourself, you, at play on the stage of your life, your part, take flight, go. Okay, okay thank you. All right. Well, that was two rounds tonight, people. This was uh, another memorable Angora. David, I'm glad you recorded us. Me too. Can't on. wait to watch this one again. Yeah, this is another memorable Angora. We felt it earlier. Um, I don't think we have immemorable Angoras. That's what's nice about a little group of artists who keep working on their expression.
Okay, so we will uh, go to YouTube. This will be recorded and posted on YouTube so that you may hear yourself and others. And you may uh, share it, tag people or share it with your friends. And um, what else? What else? Uh, I will write a brief summary of tonight on my Facebook news feed. And I always repeat, as dynamic as the seven of us have been, I can only give vague little glimpses, uh, little little hints of what we did that might stir interest, you know, from people. And then I uh, attach a song that in some way relates to what we did. So that's what I will be doing as soon as we uh, end this session, having the pleasure of writing about it. And as I mentioned, if I wrote about it truly critically, I'd need as much space as one is given in The New Yorker. <laughs> Since I'm not going to do that on Facebook, I'll give it a good shot to encapsulate some of the gems that have come out tonight. Bright, dark, and in the chaos. So, as I say, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Laura Gravel. All right, Laura, thank you. And I want to thank Bill Strangmeyer. Thank you. And I want to thank Dharma Dave, Rorschach, Wilson in San Francisco. Thank you. And I want to thank Huda Efeshetti. How, how badly did I get your last name? <laughs> in Morocco. And I want to thank, thank Angoma Hill in Harlem. And I want to thank uh, myself for having the pleasure of being able to uh, turn this machine on and listen to you all. It's been very nice for me. So everybody, thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Look forward to the Thanks, next one. everybody. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back on in two weeks. Anyway, be well. It, be at peace with yourself, even if the world outside is causing you anything but peace, mm. please. Right? Okay, good night, everybody, and good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> See you soon. Peace out. Good night, and me.